Well, welcome everybody. Thanks so much for being with us today. Whether you're here in person, joining us online, you're out in the foyer, I'm just so glad that you're here. And uh, what a privilege to get to teach you the Word of God today. Uh, we are continuing today our current teaching series called The Righteousness of God. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the very first time today, um, in this series, we're just systematically studying our way through the wonderful New Testament book called Romans, and uh, we're just taking it one section at a time, working our way from beginning to end. Last week, we were in Romans chapter 8, verses 1 through 11. A quick review, our theme was the Spirit-filled life. Uh, for those of you who were with us last week, we learned that there's a lot of uh, strange understandings in Christian circles concerning what the spirit-filled life actually looks like. And so last week we did our best to try to clear up some of that confusion. And hopefully what you learned last week and took away when you left was that the true mark of the spirit-filled life is obedience. Okay, so that was last week. This week, we continue on in Romans chapter 8. Our text today, it's verses 12 to 17. And this week, our theme is adopted by God. Adopted by God. In the Bible, adoption is the action by which a husband and wife uh, take a boy or a girl who is not their physical offspring uh, into their family as their very own child. And when it's done and all the proper legal procedures uh, are, are followed, then that child uh, inherits all the rights and privileges um, of a biological offspring of those parents. And in the Old Testament, we see at least three beautiful examples of adoption. And I want to share these with you. If you're taking notes, the first is what we could call an adoption of pity. When the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, Pharaoh, the king of Egypt, commanded that any male baby born to an Israelite family must be put to death. And so naturally, every loving mom and dad uh, did what they could to protect their child from the king's wicked edict, okay? And that included the mother and father uh, of a precious baby named Moses, they hid him for three months, but when they couldn't hide him any longer, more specifically, could no longer hide his crying, okay, they made a waterproof basket and they laid it among the reeds of the Nile River. And this was far enough away from the homes that when the baby would cry, uh, he wouldn't be heard. And uh, it seems that this may have worked for a short amount of time, uh, but one day Pharaoh's own daughter went and bathed at the exact spot where the baby was hiding among the reeds. And she immediately knew that it was one of the Hebrew babies. And she immediately knew that loving Hebrew parents were trying to protect this baby from her father's uh, wicked command that he had given that every male child born to an Israelite family must die. And even though she was pagan, she wasn't heartless. And when she heard the uh, whimpering and crying uh, of that baby boy in the most beautiful act of defiance, she decided not only to spare the child's life, but to go ahead and adopt the child as her own because she knew that this was the only way that this baby could be spared. And so we see an adoption of pity. Or maybe you would call it an adoption of compassion. Number two, if you're taking notes, the next thing we see in the Old Testament is what we could call uh, an adoption of responsibility. You may recall from the book of Esther that there was a godly Jewish man named Mordecai who was living in Persia, okay, because his uh, parents had been exiled from Jerusalem to Babylon and in time, uh, you know, he found himself living in uh, Persia. And uh, there in Persia uh, with him, was his much younger um, niece named Esther. And uh, when Esther's parents tragically were killed, uh, the Bible doesn't tell us how, but when they were killed, Mordecai, he must have been close to the family because he felt a sense of responsibility to go ahead and care for Esther. So the Bible says that he brought Esther into his own home and he uh, adopted her as, as his very own daughter. He raised her as his very own daughter. And so uh, here we see uh, what we could call uh, an adoption of responsibility. Third and final example I'll give you is this. In the Old Testament, we also see what we could call an example of love. Love. 
You may recall that King Saul and David were mortal enemies, right? Nevertheless, and this is kind of crazy, but David became best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan. And uh, David and Jonathan, uh, they were best friends. They loved each other uh, very much in the Lord, and they were just super uh, tight-knit. Well, one day Jonathan realizes the kingdom is not going to be passed on to me. David surely will take over the kingdom. And because David and Jonathan were best friends, Jonathan says to David, when, not if, but when you take over the kingdom, just promise me this, that you'll be kind to my descendants. Because the custom uh, back then was that in a transition of power, uh, the new king in place and his family would go ahead and kill uh, everyone else who came before Well, David loved Jonathan, and so he made that promise. And not only did he make the promise, he kept the promise when he became king. Many of Saul's offspring were killed in the transition, but once the dust settled, David went about keeping the promise he made to Jonathan. And so he commanded that a search be made. And he said, I want to see if there's anyone from Saul's line that can be found that I can show God's love and kindness to. And a search was made, and it was found that Saul's grandson, who happened to be David's best friend, Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, was found, and he was crippled in both feet. Nevertheless, the Bible tells us that David invited Mephibosheth uh, into his family. And the Bible says that David told Mephibosheth, here's what I'm going to do for you. All the land that your grandfather Saul owned, I'm going to give it to you. Okay, he had lost it in the transition. He said, I'm going to give it back. And he says, and you are going to go ahead and eat with me at my table. And I love this. 2 Samuel 9, 11, from that time on, Mephibosheth ate regularly at David's table like one of the king's own sons. And so we see that practically speaking, David adopted Mephibosheth into his family and gave him the same rights and privileges as one of his own biological children. And that's the very definition of adoption. And so we see this adoption of uh, pity and this adoption of responsibility and then this adoption of love. And I mention these three different adoptions because these examples of adoption in the Old Testament, I believe ultimately were given to us for this reason, to give us a beautiful word picture of what's taken place spiritually between God and his children. Friends, we have been adopted. God looked down from heaven and he saw us in our sin, destined for wrath, and he had pity on us. In the same way that um, Pharaoh's daughter had pity for Moses. God looked down on us in our sin and he saw that we were destined for wrath. And because he made us, he felt a sense of responsibility to save us from that terrible fate, which is what Mordecai did for Esther. God saw us in our sin, and he saw us destined for wrath, and so he acted out of love to spare us, as did David for Mephibosheth. You see, God has adopted us into his family. He's made us one of his own children. For those of us who have placed our faith in Jesus to forgive us of our sin, he's made us one of his own children. And as a result, we have attained all the rights and privileges of a member of God's very own family. And friends, this is why for the child of God, there's no condemnation. I mean, in Romans 8, you'll note that it begins with this teaching, therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's verse 1. But then the chapter ends, I think it's verse 34, with the same teaching. Who then will condemn us? No one. And so our passage today, verses 12 to 17, it falls within the greater context of Romans 8. And the big picture teaching of Romans 8 is that there's no condemnation for the child of God. And friends, in verses 12 to 17, we discover why there's no condemnation for the child of God. And it's because of this. God's wrath is something he's storing up for his enemies, not his children. And if you're a follower of Jesus, that's precisely what you are, an adopted child of God. And that at a high level is what I aim to show you today. In Romans 8, verses 12 to 17. All of that by way of introduction. Now let's get into our text. If you're taking notes, the first thing we see in our text is this. The first thing we see is the reality of our adoption. The reality of our adoption. 
Look with me at verse 15 where Paul writes this. You have not received a spirit of fear that makes you fearful slaves. Instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. Friends, that's the reality of our adoption, okay? We, we have been adopted. We have become a child of God. It's like this. When I was in college, I had this good friend. Uh, him and his sister were born in Seoul, Korea, but this godly, kind family here in America, in New Jersey, um, adopted him and his sister. He was in a bad situation, and he was brought here to America uh, to be loved and to be cared for uh, by his parents. And in fact, I was just texting with him yesterday. It was kind of uh, interesting. I haven't talked to him in a while, and we ended up texting uh, just last night, in fact. And he was adopted. And Paul is saying in verse 15, you have been adopted. What happened to Mike's friend? That's what happened to you, spiritually speaking. God has adopted you as his very own children. As Pharaoh's daughter adopted Moses, as Mordecai adopted Esther, and as David adopted Mephibosheth, so God has adopted us who are believers into his family. As the Apostle John put it in his gospel, to all who received him, meaning Jesus, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's our reality. And this is the reality of every single believer. I mean, to all Christians, God declares, I will be a father to you and you will be my sons and daughters. So friends, that's the first thing we see in our text. The reality of our adoption. Moving on, here now is the second thing we see in our text. We not only see the reality of our adoption, but secondly, we see the confirmation of our adoption. The confirmation of our adoption. And I love this. It's, it's beautiful. Follow me here. Even though we as believers are people of faith, that doesn't mean that we never doubt. It's not a contradiction for people of faith to sometimes doubt. And the reality is, sometimes as believers, we do doubt and what specifically do we doubt? Sometimes we doubt our salvation. We doubt that we've truly been adopted by God. We doubt that we're truly children of God. And therefore, we doubt whether or not there will be no condemnation for us when we die. And there's reasons, many reasons, why doubt sometimes slips in uh, to the life of a believer. Uh, I'll just name a few. Uh, doubt can sometimes slip in uh, when we kind of get lax about holiness, Doubt slips in when we kind of uh, become slack in our spiritual disciplines, okay? Maybe this past week, or like, I haven't read my Bible like I'm supposed to. I really kind of forgot to pray, and I didn't share my faith this week, and let's not even talk about giving tithes and offerings. We'll just skip that completely, and, you know, this and that and the other, and we just kind of like, and we start feeling like, well, I'm not doing as many Christian things as I think a Christian should, and so I'm beginning to doubt whether or not I'm a Christian, and then other times doubt comes in uh, during times of pain and sorrow and failure or disappointment, you know? We kind of fail God. We chickened out on the witnessing opportunity. Uh, we had the temptation, and instead of saying yes to God and no to sin, we said yes to sin and no to God, you know? And so now we're just like, man, I failed. I'm a failure. Uh, a true child of God wouldn't have done that. And we just doubt whether or not we're truly saved. And friends, it's because people of faith sometimes doubt that God has graciously given us in the Bible manifold confirmations of our adoption. And what we see in verses 12 to 17 are five confirmations of our adoption, assuring us of our salvation, comforting us, and letting us know that despite our shortcomings and our failures, that doesn't negate the fact that we're children of God. Okay, no amount of holiness can earn our salvation. And by the same token, we cannot sin our way out of being saved. So here we go, five confirmations. These just comforted me. They blessed me. I was like, this is awesome. I'm so glad I've seen these. I loved studying this. I, uh, what assurance of salvation it provided me, and I have no doubt it's going to do the same for you. So I hope you're paying close attention. First of the five confirmations is this. We'll call it the confirmation of holiness. And this one comes from verses 12 to 14 where Paul writes this. Dear brothers and sisters, you have no obligation to do what your sinful nature urges you to do. For if you live by its dictates, you will die. 
But if through the power of the Spirit you put to death the deeds of your sinful nature, then you'll live. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are children of God. So what is an indicator that you're truly a child of God and that the Spirit of God indwells you? The indicator is whether or not you're putting sin to death in your life. Now, Romans chapter 7, verses 14 to 25, has made it clear that none of us will do this perfectly, but just because none of us will ever do it perfectly doesn't mean that we won't do it at all. And so if we are truly followers of Jesus, what we're going to see is us putting sin to death in our lives, okay? It's likely going to be progressive. It's not overnight, and none of us does it perfectly. But as we look over uh, the horizon of our life, we ought to see ourselves putting sin to death in our lives. Now, let me encourage you. You might feel like, I don't know if I'm doing that. Let me encourage you. You are. If you're a child of God, you are. Trust me. And in fact, I want to show it to you and prove it to you. So let's look at Colossians chapter 3. Paul writes this. Once you come to faith in Jesus, you should put to death the sinful, earthly things lurking within you. He says, have nothing to do, for example, with sexual immorality, impurity, lust, and evil desires. And oh yeah, don't be greedy. He says, you used to do these things when your life was still a part of this world, but now's the time to get rid of anger and rage and malicious behavior and slander and dirty language. Don't lie to each other either, for now, you've, now that you belong to Jesus, you've stripped off your old sinful nature and all its wicked deeds. Now, here's the deal. I'm willing to bet you that you can look at that panoply of sins and you can say of at least some of them, I don't do that anymore. Now, some of those sins you're still struggling with. Guess what? I am too. That's the reality for every believer on this side of eternity. But here's what I'm betting you can say about the sins that you're still struggling with. I'll bet you can say, I don't do that quite as much anymore. And friends, if you can look at that list and say, I don't do that anymore, or look at that list and say, I don't do that as much anymore, friends, that's proof that you're an adopted child of God. The test isn't whether you obey God's law perfectly. Again, Romans 7, verses 14 to 25, you're not going to do it on this side of eternity. So the test isn't perfect obedience. The test is, is sanctification taking place in your life. Now, that's a fancy $3 theological term that simply means the process of becoming holy. Are you noticing that you're growing in holiness? And if you are, you can just go, God, thank you for this assurance of salvation. I know I'm not as holy as I should be, but I'm not what I once was. And God, this assures me of my salvation. Thank you, God. So that's the first confirmation, the confirmation of holiness. Now, here's the second. The second confirmation is the confirmation of freedom from fear. Look with me at verse 15 where Paul writes this. For you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. Here's the deal. For the unbeliever, no matter how cleverly he or she may manage to mask it or deny it, they are continually subject to fear because they're continually living in sin and therefore are continually under judgment. And back to Romans chapter 1, God puts it in their heart. He's written his laws on our heart so that we know intuitively, innately, even if we've never heard uh, a sermon about Jesus, even if we're someone living in a tribal region of a jungle and we don't have a Bible, we know that one day we will be accountable to our maker. And creation shows us that there's a creator. And we have this sense that we're not ready to stand before the creator when we die. So slavery to sin always brings slavery to fear for the unbeliever. But here's the deal. One of the gracious works of the Holy Spirit in the life of a believer uh, is this. He delivers us both from sin and from the fear of being punished for it. As Christians, we know that Jesus was on the cross to take the punishment for sin that we deserve. He wasn't dying on the cross for any sins he committed. He was dying on the cross for sins we committed. And he was taking the punishment for sin upon himself so that the punishment for sin would never have to be taken out on us. So he was enduring God's wrath against our sin on the cross. That's what Jesus was doing on the cross. 
And so the follower of Jesus has no fear of ever being punished for sin because the believer knows that his or her sins, past, present, and future, have already been punished in Jesus and through Jesus. Our sins have been punished on the cross of Christ, so we don't fear condemnation. We don't fear future judgment of God awaiting us when we die. As the author of the book of Hebrews puts it in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 15, Jesus has set free all who have lived their lives as slaves to the fear of dying. Prior to coming to Christ, we feared death. Now that we've come to Jesus, we don't have a death wish exactly, but we don't fear future judgment when we die. Now, let me be clear what the test is not. The test here is not, do I fear nothing at all? The test is, do I fear punishment for sin when I die? That's the test. I mean, right now we're living in a pandemic, okay? So you're likely kind of fearing catching COVID and, you know, uh, having the Delta variant hit you. And, you know, uh, you likely fear if you're a parent, okay? If you're a parent and you have children, you fear all kinds of stuff, you know? Because you have kids and to be a parent is to fear, you know? And, uh, you know, maybe uh, things with your job are a little shaky during the uh, pandemic and all this stuff. And so you're kind of fearing uh, job security or this or that or the other. So I don't want you thinking, I still fear some things. I must not be an adopted child of God. The test is not, do you fear nothing? The test is, do you fear future punishment for your sins? And the believer says, no, I don't fear that because I know what the Bible teaches. Jesus has taken my punishment for sin for me. I sinned in Adam, but I died in Christ. So I'm set free from what the law demands as the penalty for sin. And when you think that way, when you read the book of Revelation and you're reading about the lake of fire and you go, whoo, thank God that's not me. It's confirmation of your salvation. It's confirmation that you're an adopted child of God. Number three. Number three we'll call the uh, confirmation of address. Uh, You likely have never even thought about it, but did you know that the way you address God is confirmation that he's your father and that you're his child? Look with me at the latter part of this verse uh, 15. Paul started the verse by saying, you did not receive a spirit that makes you a slave again to fear. And then in the latter part of the verse, he goes on to say, instead, you received God's spirit when he adopted you as his own children. And now, now that you're saved, we call him Abba, which when translated into English means father. Jesus could not have been more clear That in being adopted, God has become our heavenly father. For example, Jesus says in Matthew 5, 45, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your father who is in heaven. God is our heavenly father. And it's because our adoption into God's family resulted in God becoming our father that Jesus teaches us how to pray as follows in Matthew chapter 6, verse 9. He says, pray then like this, our father... (laughs) In heaven. Okay, so Jesus uh, has made possible God becoming our Father. Now, quick question for you How many unbelievers do you know that refer to God as their Father? As you share your faith, certainly your unbelieving family members, friends, neighbors, co workers will talk about God, but they'll always refer to Him simply as God. But you, as a believer, when you pray, you address God as your Father. And that's actually confirmation of your salvation. Think of it this way. Do any of your neighbor's kids ever come over and call you dad? (laughs) They don't. They don't. So you could say that if you just kind of seen some strangers at at a park and the kid goes, dad, you can kind of assume something. Him calling that man dad or father, it, it, it proves in a sense That he belongs in that family. And in the same way, there's a sense in which referring to God as our father proves our adoption. Because people don't go around calling someone dad unless that is the reality. So this, friends, is the confirmation of address. Now you can enjoy using the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 as a model even more than you already do. Because two words in, you're reminded that you're saved. Our Father, hold on, God, let me just stop right there and give you praise. I'm an adopted child of God. 
And that's the perfect time to praise because in the beginning of the Lord's Prayer, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. It's the perfect time to pause and thank God that you're a child who belongs to him. Here now is the fourth confirmation of our adoption, moving right along. The fourth confirmation is the confirmation of fruit. Look with me at verse 16. Paul writes, The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And here, what I want to focus on is the way in which the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Because some people read this and they mistakenly think that what Paul's referring to here is uh, some mystical inner voice whispering to us, you are a child of God. And that's not what he's referring to. I think this is something objective, not subjective. There's a way in which the Holy Spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So let's talk about it. It's like this. We were all born with a rebellious spirit. As we grew up and were taught the scriptures and someone told us about Jesus, we asked Jesus to forgive us of our sins. And 2 Corinthians 5.17 says at that moment, we became a new creation in Christ. The old is gone, the new has come. Now, the old that's gone, that's the old rebellious spirit. And Paul tells us, though, what that old rebellious spirit used to produce in our life. Take a look. He says in Galatians 5, 19 to 21, that that old rebellious spirit produced this in our life. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasure, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. But again, when we gave our lives to Christ, and we appointed him Savior and Lord, we became new creations in Christ. And we received a new spirit. And according to John chapter 14, verse 17, Jesus teaches that now the Holy Spirit of God indwells our new spirit. And the Holy Spirit indwelling our spirit now produces something new. It produces a new kind of fruit in our life. And Paul tells us what that looks like in Galatians 5.22. He says, hey, no longer is it sexual immorality and outbursts of anger and selfish ambition and drunkenness and other sins like these. Now it's like this. The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So friends, it's by this fruit, the fruit of the Spirit, That the Spirit, the Holy Spirit of God, bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. Simply put, when we see the fruit in our life, we know that we're saved. God is working in us so that patience and kindness and goodness and self-control and love like comes out of our life. Now again, let me remind you, the test is not, do we see this fruit perfected in our life? None of us do. Back to Romans 7, 14 to 25. The test isn't do we see this fruit uh, manifesting itself perfectly in our life. The test is, you know, do we see it at all? Okay, maybe back in the day, BC, before Christ, you'd be at the intersection. And that person is on their phone. And they don't see that the light has turned green. And, uh, you know, you would have told them in your own unique way that they're number one. But today on the way to church, now that you're a Christian, that happened and you didn't tell them they're number one in your own special way. (laughs) It's evidence that you are an adopted child of God. You see what I'm saying? It's not about perfection. It's about direction. And if you're seeing the fruit of the Spirit uh, growing in your life, you know what? Let me just give you an example of it. A couple weeks ago, I received this wonderful, wonderful note. It was awesome. And I'm going to share with you just part of it. Mike and Kristen, so many times I have thought how thankful I am that you started New Day, prayed for me, and led me to the Lord. It took some time for me to learn and put into practice how to live for Jesus and serve him. But my life has been transformed. Skipping down, this person wrote, I turned from my sin, and now I'm a godly married woman being guided by the Lord. I am so blessed. 
Thank you, by the way, to everyone who partners with our church and you're giving and in your serving. We're working together, the pastors and the people, so that people can meet Jesus. And that's what's happening week in and week out here at New Day. And it's awesome. But here's the deal. This person wasn't writing to say, now I am perfect. You know, it's like, no, not at all. This person's writing to say, you know, I've really noticed this transformation. And yeah, that makes sense. Because like when a caterpillar becomes a butterfly, there's a metamorphosis that takes place. There's a transformation. And guys, what I'm saying is when you see your life changing and transforming, it's the fourth confirmation that you are an adopted child of God. Number five, we'll call this confirmation the confirmation of persecution. Look with me at verse 17. Paul writes this, if we are to share his glory, he's referring to Christ, if we're to share the glory of Christ, we must also share his suffering. Simply put, as Jesus used his life to help others find eternal life, he was persecuted. And as we use our life to try to help others find eternal life, we will be persecuted too. Jesus said in Matthew 10, 24, the student will be like the teacher. Okay, he's the teacher, we're the student. If he was persecuted, we will be too. Paul put it this way in 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. Everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So persecution is guaranteed for the follower of Jesus. Now, you might not die for your faith as Jesus did, as many martyrs throughout the Bible did, but any form of persecution is persecution. When you're ostracized, when people kind of judge you, when they mischaracterize you, when they say things about you that aren't true, when they kind of uh, treat you like a social pariah at work because they know what you believe uh, concerning certain you know, issues uh, in culture, so on and so forth, these are forms of persecution. Less severe forms of persecution for sure, but nevertheless is persecution. And Jesus says this in Matthew 5, 12. He says, be happy when you're persecuted. In fact, what he says is, be very glad. And the reason we're to be very glad when we're persecuted is because it's confirmation that we're truly children of God. All right, any child will bear some kind of family resemblance to their parents. And when we, the children of God, suffer persecution, it bears the family resemblance. Jesus was persecuted. We are too. And if you're a child of God, Jesus says this. Take a look. Matthew chapter 5, verse 12, the latter part of the verse. Jesus says, a great reward awaits you in heaven. If you're persecuted, a great reward awaits you in heaven. And this leads really nicely to the third and final thing uh, that we see in our text, which is this, the glory of our adoption. The glory of our adoption. Now, don't get confused uh, with where we're at in the sermon, okay? The first thing we saw in our text was the reality of our adoption. The second thing we saw in our text was the confirmation of our adoption, and there were five. And now, the third and final thing we see in verses 12 to 17 is what we're going to call the glory of our adoption, and friends, it really is a glorious thing to be adopted by God. And Paul tells us why in verse 17. Take a look. Paul says, since we are God's children, we are his heirs. In fact, together with Christ, we are heirs of God's glory. And this is the same thing that Paul told the church in Galatia. Paul told them, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then an heir through God. Likewise, the author of Hebrew tells us that Jesus Christ is the mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance. So friends, being a child of God makes us an heir of God. And as we kind of land the plane here this Sunday morning, I want to explain to you what it means that we're an heir of God. Paul says, first, it means this. Well, what exactly are we heirs of? Paul says, first, we are heirs of God. We are heirs of God. So here's the deal. The greatest thing that we're going to receive in heaven is not some material possession. 
Maybe someone does something nice or they're super patient with someone and you go, oh my goodness, your mansion in heaven's gonna be huge. And we often think of heaven in terms of uh, material blessings. And I'm not saying that those don't exist, but what I am saying is this, the greatest possession and thing we're gonna receive in heaven is not some material object, it's God himself. The psalmist declared, whom have I in heaven but thee? What he was delighting in is God himself. That's his reward. That's his treasure. Likewise, the prophet Jeremiah wrote this in Lamentations chapter 3. He says, the Lord is my portion. The Lord. What I'm excited about in heaven is getting to live with God. In his vision on the island of Patmos, the apostle John uh, heard a loud voice from the heavenly throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men, and he shall dwell among them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be among them. So God is not only the source of our inheritance, he himself is our inheritance. So, what are we heirs of? First, we are heirs of God. But secondly, Paul says this, as if that's not enough, not only are we heirs of God, additionally, we are fellow heirs with Christ. So so note Paul's language. We are heirs of God, and then we are also heirs with Christ. What does that mean? Well, I'm glad you asked. Let me explain. Friends, God the Father has appointed Jesus. Take a look at Hebrews 1, 2. He's appointed Jesus the heir of all things. God has promised Jesus a kingdom and a crown. And because we are fellow heirs with Jesus, we are destined to receive all that he receives. What Jesus receives, in other words, by divine right, we receive by divine grace. Because we're not only heirs of God, we are fellow heirs with Christ As if it wasn't enough that God would let us live with him in heaven forever, we also are co-heirs with Jesus. This is why we gather each Sunday to worship God, because it's just, it's too much. It's unbelievable. You know, so we just kind of, well, God, we just lift our hands and we clap our hands and we we sing with our voice and we just just praise you, because God, it's all just too much. Heirs of God, heirs of God with Christ, all made possible because through Jesus, we've been adopted into God's family. Would you bow your heads? Would you close your eyes? For those of you online, please do the same out in the foyer. Just bow your head, close your eyes. Let's get focused in on God. I'm going to address those of you who maybe are not yet children of God in just a moment. Uh, But first, for those of you who already are Would you join me in your heart in saying something along these lines to God? Say, Father, thank you for adopting me. Father, I'm so glad to be your child. Father, I went from being your enemy to your child. What undeserved grace. Today, I just delight in the wonderful reality of my adoption, especially now that I've seen all the various confirmations of it. God, what hope I have as a believer that one day I'll live with you forever. God, that's more than I deserve, but you go further. You not only give me the gift of yourself, a gift in value beyond measure, you also have appointed me to be co-heirs with Jesus that I might receive everything he's received. A crown and a kingdom. God, unbelievable. It really is too much. God, thank you. Now, for those of you who are believers, I've kind of guided you in a sample prayer. Just for a moment in your heart, would you just kind of now use your own words to go ahead and thank God for just a moment while I address those among us uh, here in person or online who maybe are not yet children of God. And I promise it's just going to take a second. If you're not a child of God, I just want to let you know that God loves you. He loves you so much that he sent Jesus to take the punishment that your sins deserve upon himself. God died for your sins and God died in your place. And he did that because he loves you. He wants you to live with him forever in heaven, but your sin is a problem that's preventing that from happening because it's only the child of God who becomes an heir of God. 
and a co-heir with Christ. So if you want to go from God's enemy to God's child, I'd like to lead you also in a prayer. Say something along these lines to God in your heart. Say, Heavenly Father, thank you for sending Jesus to die for my sins. God, I'm so glad that I can actually refer to you as Heavenly Father now that I'm trusting you to forgive me of my sins. I want to be a child of God. I don't deserve such a status, but today I receive it by faith. I'm trusting Jesus, the one you sent into the world to die for my sins, to save me from the penalty of sin. I don't want to pay the penalty for sin my whole life in hell when I die. I don't want to have fear of death and fear of condemnation, fear of future judgment. So God, deliver me from my sins and deliver me today also from that fear, I pray. Thank you for adopting me as your child and making me a co-heir with Christ. It's in his name that I pray. Amen. Amen. Thanks for experiencing this message with us. If you've been blessed, you can give a one-time or reoccurring gift at newdaychurch.cc forward slash giving or text any amount on your smartphone right now to 413-200-3040. We'd love to connect with you even more. So be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Instagram, and don't forget about our awesome free app where you can find all things New Day. May God bless you and we hope to see you again soon.